Good morning and welcome to worship with First United Methodist Church of Orlando. We welcome you and we are glad you are with us uh, for this special time this morning. We have several announcements. Uh, of course, we hope you are keeping track of what we promote online, uh, on our website, on our social media, and of course, on our weekly emails, but, but several exciting things that we want you to know about this morning. Uh, tonight, here at the church in the courtyard and portico, we are having a special worship experience uh, called Wonder Worship Night. Uh, we'll be having presentations uh, to lead us in worship from, from several of our music groups. Uh, we think this will be a blessing. So we hope that you'll come tonight at six o'clock. Uh, we hope that you will wear your masks and uh, that you will uh, respect uh, protocols so that we will be safe and distanced from each other and yet still together. So hope to see you here tonight for that. Uh, we also want to remind you that uh, we have exciting announcement that on November 1st, uh, we are resuming in-person worship at 9.30 and 11, uh, but a little different. Uh, these services will be identical, they'll be casual, they'll be simple, and they will be outside in the courtyard. Uh, so we hope that you will come and be part of that. We are asking that you register RSVP online just to let us know uh, how many to expect, who will be here so we can plan accordingly. Also so we can make plans for our children's ministry during that time. Now we fully know that not everybody is ready to be back in person and we respect that. Uh, so know that you have options. If, if you're not ready to be here on Sunday morning, uh, you can continue to worship online at 1030. That will be available to you, uh, even as we begin to worship in person. We also invite you to join us on Thursday mornings here in the sanctuary when we pre-record the services. We do that every Thursday morning at 1030. You are welcome to join us. We just ask that you call into the church office to uh, RSVP to let us know to expect you. That's all of our announcements. Like I said, I hope you will continue to keep an eye on our email uh, and on our social media. Each time we gather for worship, we light candles on the altar to remind us that Christ is with us. The scripture says that, that he is the light that shines in the darkness. And so during this season of pandemic, as we've been worshiping apart online, we've been encouraging you to light candles at home to remind us that, that the presence of Christ is, is here with us in this beautiful sanctuary, but the presence of Christ is also with you wherever you are this morning as we worship together. So I invite you, join me as we light our candles together. Please join me in the call to worship. Lord of heaven and earth, of all nations and peoples. And the people respond, reveal yourself to those who are suffering. Reveal yourself to all who are refugees. And the people respond, reveal yourself to those who are powerful. Reveal yourself to all who are powerless. And the people respond, reveal yourself to ordinary people in their everyday lives that this world might reflect your love and your glory.
Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me in the glory of Patri. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Good morning, church, and happy Sunday. Today's verse is from Judges 4, verses 1 through 10. After Ehud's death, the Israelites again did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord turned them over to King Jabin of Hazor, a Canaanite king. Now the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth Hageman. Sisera, who had 900 iron chariots, ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. And when the people of Israel had finally had enough, they cried out to the Lord for help. Deborah, the wife of Lepidoth, was a prophetess who was judging Israel at the time. She would sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites would go to her for judgment. One day, she sent for Barak, son of Abinoman, who lived in Kedesh in the land of Naphtali. And she said to him, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Call out ten thousand warriors from the tribes of Naphtali and Jebulun at Mount Tabor. And I will call out Sisera, commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors, to the Kishon River. And there I will give you victory. Barak told her, I will go, but only if you go with me. Very well, she replied, I will go with you. But you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kedesh. At Kedesh, Barak called together the tribes of Jeblin and Naphtali, and ten thousand warriors went up with him. Deborah, too, also went with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Recently, on our midday devotions on Facebook, I've been challenging those who have been participating and watching to join me in daily prayer for, for three things. I've been inviting us to pray for the upcoming election. I've been asking us to pray for uh, our world during the season of pandemic. And I've been asking you to pray for our church. And I would ask that uh, you join me in prayer for those three things this morning and that you continue to pray uh, as you feel led for each of those three, three things, uh, the upcoming election, the pandemic, and for our church. Will you join me now in a time of prayer? Oh, good and gracious God, in this time of worship today, we seek you. We seek your presence. We seek your wisdom. We seek your intervention in this world. In this season, many of us at First Church are praying for these three things, O oh Lord. We're calling out to you that you would intervene, that you would be present, that you would make a difference in our upcoming elections, in this global pandemic, and for our beloved church. Lord, we may not all agree on how uh, the election should go. We may not all agree on who should be elected. But I think all of us would agree, agree that this is a, a difficult time. A time of hostility, a time of division, a time of stress and anxiety, worry. And so as it comes to our 
upcoming election. We seek the peace, the peace that passes understanding, the peace that is only possible by the intervention of your Holy Spirit into the affairs of this world. Lord, we pray that this will be a peaceful election regardless of the outcomes. We pray, Lord, that as we approach the polls, as we make our own decisions about how we will vote and for whom we will vote, that we would not approach these decisions casually, nor from purely a political mindset, and rather than having the mind of a particular philosophy or, or economic position, that we would have the mind of Christ, that you would give us divine knowledge and insight, that we would view our vote as an act of stewardship. Ultimately, O oh God, we pray for the healing of our nation and that this upcoming election would be part of that healing. Lord, we pray for this global pandemic that has claimed far too many lives, that has, has interfered with the lives of, of every person on this planet in one way or another. We pray for all who grieve the loss of someone because of this pandemic. We pray for all who are currently sick, that you would heal them. And we pray for the frontline workers who care for them, especially those who are uh, experiencing the strain of caring for so many. We pray for the scientists, those you've gifted with, with knowledge, that they would find uh, a vaccine and therapeutics quickly. And Lord, we do pray again for your divine intervention. Even as humans work hard to manage and bring an end to this pandemic, that you would do only what you can do to bring this pandemic to an end, to restore and protect the health of many. Lord, this season of pandemic has been difficult on everyone, on young people and their education, on parents and families, on, on the older members of our society, on business owners, on those who have been laid off, fired, furloughed, or gone out of business. It's been a hard time. And it's been difficult for our church. And so, Lord, we pray for fortitude. We pray for strength. We pray for endurance. We pray for vision. Lord, as we begin our outdoor services in the coming weeks, would you protect us from the possibility of infection? Would you guide us to make wise choices to protect the most vulnerable? Give us wisdom. May we be known as a church that is wise, particularly in this season. And Lord, at some point, uh, perhaps you would begin it now. Would you lead us into a new season of vitality? Help us to be the strongest church we can, even in this difficult time and certainly beyond it. Help us to be a light that shines in the darkness. Help us to be the salt of the earth. Help us to be an inspiration to those who need it. Help us to be compassionate to those who need compassion. Lord, we pray today that you would raise up new leaders like Deborah and so many others that we have read about in the Bible who heard your call and were obedient to it. And Lord, we pray for the resources to do all this church is capable of doing. We know that you are a God of unlimited resources. And so we ask in faith that you help us through this time and that you lead us to a better time in the days to come. We ask this prayer in the mighty name of Jesus who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Again, friends, I would ask you in the days to come to continue joining me in prayer for these three things, for the upcoming election, for the pandemic, and for our church. Let us continue to storm the gates of heaven with these requests, knowing that God is faithful.
throughout this sermon series, This Is My Story, we have talked about how the Bible reveals God's love for us and unveils God's plan to save the world. God has chosen to save the world by working through people, ordinary human beings like you and me. First, God called a man Abraham. He said that he would bless Abraham with a family. Abraham's family would go on to be a blessing for the world. God worked through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph to pass God's blessing down through multiple generations of a family. But what happens when that family gets so large and extended that they become their own nation and people group? Who leads the people when there is no longer one living patriarch? Who holds the people together? Who ensures that the blessing continues? Who keeps the people from descending into chaos? God calls and raises up new leaders to lead the Israelite people. God calls Moses. Moses is a descendant of Abraham. He is a member of the family. Moses leads the people out of slavery in Egypt. He leads the people for the 40 years that they live in the wilderness. God works with Moses to establish the covenant way of life for the Israelite people. God calls Aaron and the Levite men to serve as priests for the Israelites. The Levites organize the practices and rituals of the Israelite religion. God works through Moses and other elders to provide order and stability for the Israelites. Prior to Moses' death, God calls Joshua to be the next leader of the Israelite people. Moses passes the baton of leadership down to Joshua. It is Joshua who leads the Israelites into the promised land. It is Joshua who serves as military, political, and social leader for the Israelites. Joshua works with elders of the 12 tribes to settle in the promised land, the land of Canaan. Joshua reminds the Israelite people of all that God has done for them and instructs the people to continue living by the covenant. Then Joshua dies. The Israelite people served God and continued to live by the covenant while the elders who served with Joshua were still alive. These elders, they had seen all that God had done for them and they were able to tell the stories and to remind the people. But over time, these elders also died. The generations that came after did not know God and did not know of the things that God had done for Israel. There is a vacuum of leadership and collective memory among the Israelites. The book of of Judges records this chaotic period for the Israelites. In the book of Judges, like the book of Joshua, we read about battles between the Israelites and other people groups living in the land. The accounts of these battles are quite violent, and it is particularly disturbing to read accounts of violence against women. It is helpful to remember that like what Pastor Vance said last week about the book of Joshua also applies to the book of Judges. The book of Judges was written down during the time of the Babylonian exile. Stories of the Israelites settling in the promised land were passed down orally across generations. We can imagine that with each retelling, the Israelites increased the number of soldiers participating in the battles. The Israelite victories became greater and greater. The battles more gruesome. The oral and written stories of the judges tried to make sense of the chaos of the Babylonian exile by reminding Israel how God had brought order out of chaos in the past. This gave them hope that God could could bring order out of their chaos in the Babylonian exile. As we read through the book of Judges, we begin to pick up on a recurring behavioral cycle. The Israelite people, they have a central leader, and all seems to go well with that leader. The leader dies, and no new leader rises up to lead the people. Without leadership to provide the structure 
and guidance for the people. The Israelites, they do evil in God's eyes. They reject God's covenant way of life for them. They turn away from God and they begin to worship idols. The Israelites descend into chaos and then they are overtaken by an enemy. The Israelites, they experience difficulty and oppression as consequences of their evil actions. The Israelites, they cry out to God to save them. God hears their cries and raises up a new leader, a judge in this case, to deliver the people from their oppressors. The Israelites obey God and God's appointed judge. The judge offers wisdom, counsel, and leadership to the people. The judge is also a warrior who leads Israel into battle against their oppressors. The judge and Israel defeat the oppressors and again experience freedom in the land. The Israelites live in peace until that judge dies. After the judge dies, the cycle repeats itself all over again. The Israelites turn away from God. They're overtaken by an enemy. They experience a difficulty and oppression. They cry out to God. God reaches out to save them by working through a person, a judge. There are 13 judges named in the book of Judges. Today we're going to look at one particular judge, the only female judge by the name of Deborah. What do we know about Deborah? God raises Deborah up as a judge after Judge Ehud died and the Israelite people were overtaken by the Canaanite king Jabin. King Jabin and his military commander Sisera oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. We're told that Deborah is a prophet and a leader in Israel as well as a wife. She sits in the shade under a palm tree and judges disputes among the Israelite people. She offers wise counsel, direction, and leadership to the Israelites. She issues a command to a military leader by the name of Barak, instructing Barak to assemble 10,000 Israelite men at Mount Tabor. Barak and the Israelites will battle against the Canaanite commander Sisera and his soldiers. Deborah promises that the Israelites will overpower Sisera. But Barak seems to balk at Deborah's instruction. He indicates that he will only go and do as Deborah commands if she goes with him. If she assembles with the Israelites at Mount Tabor, and if she marches with them in battle against Sisera. We do not know why Barak bargains with Deborah. Does he fear Sisera and the Canaanite soldiers? Does he question the soundness of Deborah's military plan? Does he doubt Deborah because she is a woman? Deborah replies to Barak, I'll definitely go with you. However, the path you're taking won't bring honor to you because the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. So sure enough, Deborah, Barak, and the Israelites, they assemble at Mount Tabor. Sisera and his army arise. The Israelites attack the Canaanites. Sisera and his army are in panic. Sisera abandons his army and runs away. The Israelites defeat the Canaanites that day. Sisera escapes, and, and he finds refuge among the descendants of Moses' father-in-law. A woman by the name of Jael allows Sisera to hide under a blanket in her tent. Now, can you imagine the Israelites telling this story? At this point, they're probably kind of laughing at Sisera. Oh, he's hiding in a woman's tent. He's hiding under a blanket. Sisera falls asleep, and Jael slips back into the tent, and she kills Sisera. Barak chases after Sisera, and he eventually finds his way to Jael's tent. Jael shows Barak the body of Sisera, confirming the words of Deborah that Sisera would be defeated, not by Barak or another Israelite man or soldier, but by a woman, Jael. The Israelites first defeat Sisera and then King Jabin. The Israelites are freed from their oppressors and they experience peace in the land for another 40 years. 
Personally, I love the story of Deborah. I love that a story of a woman warrior leading the people of Israel with wisdom, justice, and strength is included in the Bible. We often read and hear stories of male biblical leaders and heroes. And often we hear these stories more often than we do the stories of female leaders and biblical heroes. While there are more stories of male leaders in the Bible, the stories of female leaders tell us that indeed God can and does work through women. God calls women to places of leadership within all sorts of communities, faith communities, governments, military, society, and families, to name a few. The God who creates all people in the image of God also invites all people into a covenant way of life. God calls all people, people of all genders, races, abilities, ages, nationalities, orientations, etc., to participate with God in God's covenant way of life. Again and again, God invites the Israelites to live God's covenant way of life. Even with a central leader, the Israelites are prone to wander and to leave the God they love. God raises up judges to be the central leaders for the people of Israel. Now let's be honest, some judges were better than others. Some were better leaders than others. The story of Deborah highlights the Israelites' need for good leadership. Leadership that will restore the people to a covenant way of life. Good leaders like Deborah listen for God and speak God's message to the people. Good leaders listen to the people. They mediate conflicts among the people and settle disputes. They offer wise counsel. They offer correction when needed. These leaders help restore relationships among people. Good leaders like Deborah serve alongside and with the people they are leading. When Barak does not want to fight unless Deborah is there, Deborah agrees to go with Barak and the Israelites. She does not send Barak to do something that she herself will not do. Good leaders remember the people they are serving. They empathize. They are people of integrity whose actions match their words. Good judges like Deborah identify oppression both within the community and outside the community. Good leaders like Deborah do not ignore oppression. They work to end oppression. These leaders do what is right even when it is hard. Good leaders stand up to oppressors and fight against injustice. Good leaders work for shalom, holistic, healthy, abundant life for all people and all creation. And good leaders do not stop until there is peace in the land. We see evidence of good, Deborah-like leadership within leaders throughout history. Deborah-like leaders are found in people among us today. People like Rachel Den Hollander, Prosecutor Angela Povolitis, and Judge Rosemarie Aquilina. Rachel Den Hollander is a former gymnast who was sexually abused as a teenager by Dr. Larry Nasser while under his medical care. She knew that what had been done to her was wrong and that it was not of God. At age 32, she came forward to tell her story of the evil that she had experienced at the hands of Nasser. Her public testimony started the movement for justice for all of the survivors who had experienced sexual abuse and oppression at the hands of Nasser. Because of Rachel's courage, other survivors found the courage to come forward and to tell their stories too. Prosecutor Angela Povolitis, she listened to the stories of these survivors and she believed the women. She pursued justice. She advocated for the survivors. When Nasser pled guilty, Prosecutor Povolitis did not accept the guilty plea unless every survivor who wanted to come forward had the chance to tell their story, to confront their oppressor, and to share their impact statement. 
The judge in the case, Judge Rosemarie Aquilina, agreed. In the end, 156 survivors came forward to go on record and to tell their stories of abuse. Judge Aquilina held Nasser accountable to the crimes he had committed and ensured that he was in the room to hear the stories of the pain that he had caused. Prosecutor Povolitis and Judge Aquilina worked for the recovery and healing of the survivors by allowing them the opportunity to speak their truth. People like Representative John Lewis are Deborah-like leaders. John Lewis became a leader in the civil rights movement because segregation and racial discrimination are not compatible with the Christian faith. He fought against oppression by participating in sit-ins at segregated Nashville lunch counters and by being one of the original 13 Freedom Riders. He and Hosea Williams fought for justice when they led 600 people across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama on what is now known as Bloody Sunday. When the marchers stopped to pray, Alabama state troopers attacked with tear gas and nightsticks. Lewis was beaten and suffered from a skull fracture. Yet he lived his life with the prophetic conviction that when you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have to speak up. You have to say something. You have to do something. God invites us today to live God's covenant way of life. God calls and raises up leaders among us to be prophets, wise counselors, good leaders, unifiers, relationship restorers, justice warriors, oppression enders, and peacemakers. God calls these leaders to bring order out of chaos and to right all wrongs. The question for us today, the question for you, and for me, will we, will you, will I be one of these Deborah-like leaders? Will we work with God to bring God's peace to the land? Amen.
Friends, we thank you for joining us in worship today. Before your time of worship comes to an end and, and this video concludes, I hope you will include in your worship your weekly offering. Uh, you aren't here, obviously, to put something in the plate, so we hope you will take a moment to either mail in your offering or to go to our website and to give online. We also want to mention uh, that you hopefully have received your third quarter giving statement in the mail recently. Hope you'll take a look at that and honor the pledge you made in 2020 and the coming months before the year comes to an end. Also, I hope you'll be looking for this year's stewardship mailing, which will come to you just in the next week or so as we begin to consider what pledges uh, we will make toward the 2021 year. Your participation, your support will be especially important as we begin the work of recovery and reinstituting many of the in-person programs we hope to implement in the coming year. So please be faithful and intentional in that process and that decision. Again, we thank you for joining us. Obviously, we wish we could have been together today. Look forward to when we'll be able to be together on November 1st for those who are ready to do so. As we come to the close of our worship, I invite you to join me in these words of blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and forevermore. Go in peace, my friends. Thank you.